I'm with Pastor Becky Keenan, founder of One with Israel. Now, Becky, what is One with Israel? One with Israel is an educational organization, secular, that aims to engage generational awareness on the role of Israel in the world and how we should respond to it. And have you been very busy defending Israel since October the 7th? I've been very busy sharing the facts of October the 7th, which are that on the 6th there was sleepy border and people were in their homes, and on the 7th they were massively murdered by terrorists from Hamas that came into civilian communities and killed upwards of 1,200 people and kidnapped others. And what sort of things do you do with One with Israel? We do seminars, educational journeys, also a chronological teaching of history because in the West people just don't know history. So it's kind of like starting with the ABCs of the basics all the way up to having signature lectures, and you can go as far as you want. Some people want the basics. Some people want to go forward. I, I believe now, with what's happened, there's a, a peak in interest about the Middle East. So I've been quite busy these days. Is there a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to Israel? Absolutely. I think it depends on, uh, for some people, in, in the way they were brought up. Some of them are influenced by their parents one way or the other. Other people think for themselves that they're self-educated or they have a history degree or they're into politics or into geo, you know, political issues and stuff like that. Others from a religious point of view, it's very complex. As you know, all the layers that this amazing region has a richness. Uh, and unfortunately, it's hard to, to keep up with it. So, But in general, yes, I see a peak in interest. And I've been very busy educating people, leaders, business leaders, religious leaders as well, in why we need to be informed about this because this relationship with Israel affects the whole world. We know that as a, the tiniest a country it is, as small as El Salvador or the state of New Jersey, and yet it's in the news day in and day out. So it's very important, yeah. Is there a lot of misunderstanding within the church as well? I think that from a religious point of view, if you believe in replacement theology, then you will completely misinterpret and see Israel the wrong way. That's my my view of what I think the truth is. The church did not replace Israel as the people of God and the Word of God, which is the Bible. So I think the history is the church has had a terrible track. The Christian church, a terrible track record with the Jews, and uh, and even now with anti you know Zionism. I believe anti Zionism is anti Semitism. Mm. Now you're here in Israel during wartime. Why did you want to come now? I wanted to come now. Number one, because the regurgitation of evil anti Semitism and hatred towards Israel is off the charts. I think the common man on the street feels, and to the higher, uh, highest levels here of leadership, they're all feeling isolated, rejected, evil spoken of, in the news things are twisted. And I am an American, and my country is also, let's say, exerting certain pressures politically on Israel that, are, that have uh, physical and tangible effects down to to everyone's family. So I wanted to come here to say upwards of 85% of the American public is with the people of Israel. They believe that what happened on October the 7th was a massacre, and it is actually the largest killing of Jews since the Holocaust. We're living in historic times. We can't equalize this and, and make it smaller and explain it away. There is no justification for what they've done until today. There's hostages uh, somewhere in Gaza, upwards of 200 and some days in captivity. Medicine would never reach them by the glorious Red Cross. We're seeing the failing of historic institutions only when it comes to Israel. It's unbelievable. No protest at the UN when Assad kills what thousands upon thousands of people in Syria or North Korea you know, kills people or China or the stuff in Ukraine. There was a little bit more of a sympathy for Ukraine. But when it comes to Israel, if it has to do with the Jews, you know, it's news. And if it doesn't have to do with the Jews, it's not news. So coming here is basically showing solidarity and support. But what have you been doing while you've been here? 
Well, yes. So another thing that informs my life, one of my layers, is the layer of faith. And in the New Testament, it says that faith without works is dead. So I think for those who are listening to this that are people of faith, we should pray for this. But then we should also advocate. We should also network. We should also liaise with other organizations and institutions in whatever your realm of influence is. So while I've been here, I've been in many communication and media outlets uh, sharing my opinions and sharing what America thinks, the regular American, and also people in in different organizations that are pro-Israel, so to speak. Being pro-Israel is also being pro-Muslim, is also being pro-Druze, is also being pro-Bedouin, because remember when those rockets come, the Iron Dome defends everybody equally. I've had some very important meetings moving forward uh, with just different people in the f- <laughs> interview me again in six months and, uh, you'll see but it's been just really amazing to see w- what we want to do look uh, holocaust education education when it comes to anti-semitism everybody's doing it in every way shape or form and apparently some things are not working if you look at our university campuses and you see the different people in social media influencers sharing inaccuracies sharing sometimes just basic ignorant things it's just bias and a lot of emotion there's a lot of emotion driven media so we need to also pivot and we need to change and we need to be organic in order to address that way of communication yeah we see a lot about the um, student protests did they actually have they actually researched and, and know what they're standing up for or do they know nothing but they're just going with the trend Well, the trend happens to be that there are organized anarchists that are well-funded by some very influential people that have world views that have been very detrimental in Europe and in Israel, in America, and all over. Uh, It's been a rearranging of society as we know it and of societal institutions. So this is a part of of a very well-organized plan in, in terrorism seems to fit right into it. So when it comes to our universities, we know that there are some big players, Qatar, with its unending funding. Some institutions in the United States have such a large amount of foreign students on scholarship from some very bad players that only now we're opening our eyes after this eruption of hatred to see what that funding has done. And it's been years, years of this happening behind, you know, not closed doors, but kind of like behind our backs. And now suddenly we're waking up and we're alarmed, we're concerned, and it's just really important. I come from the great state of Texas, and there was a cooperation with Qatar with one of our universities that has been cut. And I think everybody else needs to do it, as well as, honestly, you hear politicians promising that they will pull the student visas of those calling for the destruction, not only of Israel, but of America. So this is a a wake-up call for the Saturday people, the Sunday people, and everybody else in between. You've had the opportunity to be on I-24 News. How was that? How do you know? Yes, it was uh, interesting because after I did hair and makeup and took pictures and did all that fun stuff, you know, it's lighthearted. You're getting to meet new people. I was sitting at uh, at a lounge area and suddenly you need to understand this doesn't happen in the United States. If we had the barrage of missiles you have, it would be a one time thing and then we would take care of it. And yet here in Israel, they have to put up with that. I was sitting and I wasn't doing anything. I was looking at my phone. I noticed people running. I didn't hear an alarm. I'm, you know, I'm into my reel that I'm watching on Instagram or whatever it was. And then suddenly somebody yelled at me. Some good Israeli, you know, yelled at me, get up now and run now. So... I just got my phone. I said, thank you. I got my purse. I think they were a little frustrated because I wasn't flustered or anything. I just did was absorbing. And I went to the shelter until they gave us the all clear. And then after that, we drank coffee. Someone said, do you want coffee? That is the most abnormal, psychologically weird Twilight Zone experience I've had. So that happened in Yafa at Y24. Very interesting. <laughs> well, that's life here, isn't it? It is, but I cannot protest enough and say that it should not be 
expected of Israelis to live that way. It's not right. No other country lives that way. And yet it's been normalized. I'm against normalizing that type of acceptance because it's Israel. Oh, they, they live like that all the time. Oh, they're tough. Oh, they take it. Oh, it's been happening for years. None of those are valid reasons for this to be tolerated. Israel should have, let's not get into should haves, but I think that this government has the obligation, any, any country's government's first obligation is to protect and defend its citizenry. So the government of Israel, whoever it is, whatever party it is, whoever it is, the prime minister and their cabinet, their obligation is to defend their citizens. And that, there's a lot to talk about. Have you had the opportunity to be part of March of the Living? And what is that? The March of the Living is a glorious movement. And when I say glorious, I mean in the sense of reconciliation, because the topic is horrible and deeply disturbing historically. It's the Holocaust, the Shoah. But in 2007, I believe, in Germany, in the town of Tübingen, a group of young uh, German born-again Christians began to be curious about their forefathers and noticing that they had all been told that they held these benign positions during the war. Nobody had been part of the war of the of Hitler's war machine. So they on their own initiative went and investigated to get their grandparents, uncles, whatever historic papers of their service, only to find out that they were descendants of Nazis, SS men and women, whatnot, and it was an earthquake in the church, in the town who during the time of Hitler, uh, Tübingen has a very famous uh, university and it was used, I believe, to educate SS officers. It was really the beautiful side of a very evil thing. And uh, when they did that, they felt disappointed, lied to. It's kind of like an identity crisis, right? Because it's like everybody's in on it to say that your grandfather was a great guy and he was a killer. So they came face to face with it. I'm jumping here. They owned it. And wherever there were death marches, they started marches with Holocaust survivors who embraced them, saw their sincerity, their repentance, and their desire to restore as much as they could. Now, it's in so many countries, dozens of countries, thousands upon thousands of people march in favor of Israel. And they come to Israel, and when it's here, it's not the March of Life. Here, it's the March of the Nations. And this year, I'm happy to report they had a conference here in Jerusalem that I attended right in the same building where Adolf Eichmann was judged and justly, you know, given the death sentence. And we all can see that on YouTube, the trial was uh, televised to the whole world. That's where they chose to have their conference, which was, by the way, absolutely amazing and inspiring. After all these many years, they persevered, giving an example to the world that there is hope, that there is a new day for Germany. At least they've owned it. The Christian church has had a bad reputation, but today, does the Christian church have a good reputation when it comes to Israel? Is there a good relationship between Jews and Christians? That's a loaded question, and the term church... uh, it includes so many, so many denominations, branches, as you well know, that, you know, being someone that, that's in this part of the world and from the West. I don't know that I could measure if the church is doing well. I wish I could see more people raising their voices. I know in America, though, we are based on the facts we see, not just the, what informs our faith, the Bible and whatnot, prophetic passages in the Bible and whatnot. We do support Israel as freedom-loving people. This is the only true democracy in the Middle East. It's the only place where people truly have human rights. And if you're gay, God help you if you decide to be queer for Palestine. I want to encourage you to go take a, you know, you'll last five minutes. I just want to warn you. If you're a woman, you are worth absolutely nothing. And the truth of the matter is that Israel is this little country that's not perfect, that is to be criticized. There's so much that could change, even in their leadership now. But at the same time, their foundations are correct. 
And they have given the world judicial systems. There's so much that they've given, I mean, human rights. And, and the, their modern contributions, for instance, are unparalleled by any other country or people group. So Israel should be defended, lauded, uh, learned from, which is what people that uh, Arab countries that are in the Abraham Accords are actually having meaningful cultural, educational, agricultural, IT, technology, all kinds of <laughs> exchange, safety and security. I could go on and on. Exchanges that are bringing stability, greater stability to the region. I think that uh, Iran really planned this attack, this slaughter that was meant to be deeper, go deeper into the country, which is quite horrifying. We see unrepentant Hamas and we see them encouraging and inflaming the Arab kid on the street that listens to the rhetoric. We got the, you know, the Jew, we killed them, we slaughtered them. It's very inflammatory and there's no sense of them wanting to take it back, to be ashamed. In fact, I happened to, to see the film that journalists saw, the 47-minute compilation, and what was most important to me was the glee that these terrorists had of all ages, calling their mother, the women are involved, calling their father, the father is involved. This is a young man. What are we doing? We need to rethink Oslo. We need to rethink the educational system, the checks and balances. Israel, at this point, has a huge existential threat and has no partner in peace. Absolutely not in these people. And we know that Iran is the largest exporter of terrorism in the world, and they are the enemy of not only Israel, but of America, where I come from. I'm the big target. I'm the big goal here. So... Are they planning attacks in America? Will they be signaled at some point and slaughter a few people or a lot of people? We have an open border. I don't know. And there have been terror cells in America for years. Is this plausible, the unthinkable? This is not a conspiracy theory. Maybe on October the 5th it was, or October the 6th, but on the 7th it became a terrible reality. And as I've been interacting with Regular Israelis, I talk to people on the street and in important meetings with higher-ups and people in government and in different institutions. Everybody is horrified, shocked, sad, dismayed that this could happen. Not only could happen, it did happen. And the other side is denying it, is not owning it. There is no prospect of peace, true peace when Israel really wants to live in harmony with everyone. People that don't know don't realize all the different people groups that live here, all the different religions that are practiced here. There is, you know, freedom of religion. I have spoken to Israeli Arabs that live and that are full citizens that are concerned about what the others are saying and or other people that share the same faith. They're like, I'm not that. I don't believe that way. Uh, don't count me in with that group. I want to live in peace and prosperity with Jews. They're my neighbors. I work with them. I, you know, do all this stuff. So I always see a silver lining, and I believe there's hope. I think this is a huge learning opportunity, but it's also a time for strength. People are not going to learn anything unless Israel is strong. Israel, find your backbone and find your grit and be the Israel we're all proud about. Have you had the opportunity to go down to the where the sites of where the terrorist attacks took place? I wanted, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come, to pay my respects at the site. So I was able to go to the Nova Festival site. I'm going to tell you one thing. When I went to Auschwitz-Birkenau, and we drove up in the bus and I saw how large this place was, this killing machine. It astounded me. We were in a really high bus and I, I could see it was a mile after mile. It just went on and on. This is professional killing at its best. With bids for the ovens and bids for this. When it comes to October the 7th and the Nova Festival, I, you know, I've seen a lot of the footage, but once you're there... You see how vast that flat place was, although it has trees, they have leaves on the top, right? But there's the tree trunk is bare, right? It's just a brown tree trunk. 
And then you think about how this was the bonus killing place. When they came, it was like, let's pick them all. And there was nowhere to hide in this huge flat place. And they had to run for miles and miles and miles. This was horrific. The part that people see most in the news is where the platform, the the stage was. That's where they've put the faces and they have flowers and pictures. People have seen that a lot. That's where the main stage was. But behind it, there's a forest of trees that are bare in the bottom, nowhere to hide. And in front of it were the tents where these young people were staying. And it's huge. And what they did to those women and men, which has not been published, is absolute barbarism. It's heinous. And I would tell you that we almost need to coin a word for the depraved massacre and mutilation and desecration with glee and purpose that they did. Though They wanted to shed blood. And when the IDF came, what they found was unspeakable carnage. But even these words, I feel as I'm talking to you, I I can't express it properly without going into graphic descriptions, but there has to be some new word that describes this type of depraved behavior. What is your prayer for Israel today? If I said peace, that's such a vast term, although it is peace, because if you study the word peace, there's so many meanings to it, right? So I wish her peace and with all its meanings. But before this massacre, Israel was terribly divided. And I think that Iran saw an opportunity, Hamas saw an opportunity, And many bad players have seen an opportunity whenever there's weakness in any country, by the way, including mine. So this is not a criticism, but I pray that Israel stays united because there is strength only in unity. I pray that this is not politicized by any party here with hatred, personal hatred and emotionalism against people that are in positions of authority making decisions who are not perfect. I am not defending anyone in particular, but my prayer is that there is a coming together, which I do see, because unilaterally people understand, but I'm beginning to feel and hear voices that can bring division and weakness, and this thing is not over. It's not over in Gaza. It's not over post-Gaza. There have been no investigations. There's just so much to process and to go through that I'm afraid you know, the people have to remain resilient and strong. So there's a complete victory. And while my president said that he did not believe in a complete victory, I think he is wrong. How dare he say that? How dare he say that for Israel? Would we have said that? Well, Hitler, well, well, with him, there's not going to be complete victory. So think about that. What an anomalous, horrific, ridiculous, and unfair statement that was that I do not agree with. We pray for total victory. That's what my prayer is. And what's your Facebook page? One with Israel is the organization. For those who might have friends in Spanish, I have one that's Uno con Israel. And my personal one, of course, is Becky Keenan, Becky Amiga, and Instagram. Okay, Becky. Well, thank you very much. This has been lovely chatting with you, sadly, about very complex topic, but I pray for a better future.